I had been waiting for this man all my life, and he was my soulmate. I didn't think I'd found true love at all. I knew I had. I knew it was special. I saw her. I couldn't take my eyes off her. I am madly in love, yes, but not blindly. Love is blind. I saw what I chose to see. So I knew everything I was doing was wrong. If you really, really love somebody, nothing in this world can take that love away. Absolutely nothing. I met Martin when I was working behind my mother's pub and he walked in and I thought, oh man, man of my dreams. He was just so handsome and um, he ordered a drink and I sort of couldn't take my eyes off him. And later he asked me my name and he said he was a policeman. And he asked me if I'd like to go out for a date. And of course I said yes, definitely. He took me out to a couple of places and it was just brilliant. He had a pretty hard life, you know. He um, left school and he went straight into the army and he worked himself up to a special agent who worked in Northern Ireland and he worked undercover there. And um, he had awful experiences there, which obviously made me feel closer to him because I felt, well, you know, this guy can actually trust me and tell me things about his life which are very personal. And even on one occasion, he saw his best friend get shot. You know, he sat there and he cried. For the first time in my life, I just felt instantly in love. But just one week after meeting Martin, Joanne had to return to her home and job 300 miles away on the south coast. When I was sitting on the train, I thought, I am in love, and it was really hard for me to let go, because I could just picture us already just being together. I think it was the next day I actually got this letter from him, and actually in the letter he said that he loved me, and I thought, this is, this is just not happening, you know, and I just knew at that point that I wanted to be with him. Martin said to me that he's got this £100,000 compensation coming through because he had actually had an accident at work. And he proposed to me that, you know, wouldn't it be wonderful if we were together? And would you like to come and live in the Lake District? And so what we did is we took a trip to the Lake District and he showed me where he used to live, the mountains he's climbed, and you could actually just imagine it living in this little house just together outside a big sort of river. And I said, yes. And we were gonna get married and have children and live happily ever after, you know? I was absolutely desperate to be with him. He was my soulmate. This is the person I'm gonna spend the rest of my life with. And I would have given up anything. sitting at lunch with one of my good friends, Graham, uh, chatting about things guys normally chat about. And I noticed this young lady uh, walking the restaurant, wearing all blue, blue fur coat and a blue hat, looking absolutely striking, devastating. I couldn't take my eyes off her. I had this strange sort of feeling inside me. And I said to my friend Graham, I'm gonna marry that young lady. I don't know what it was, whether it was physical, or something else, but. It happened to me. It never happened before. I decided to try and find out something about her, who she was, where she worked, how can I meet her, try and woo her, caught her. I knew nothing about her at this stage, so I had to try and find information about her. 
I was lucky she had to um, t do a job where she had to learn some of the computers and the telex machines, which was very close to where, where I worked. So what I did, I started to find excuses to be in that area, or maybe try and see in there, go and get a telex, go and fix something in there. Any excuse I could, I found a way of trying to be there when she would be there. And that was my approach. There was this aura about her that just said, you have to treat this lady differently. You can't go about a normal approach, something different about Stephanie. And so I thought, OK, I think I have to treat this very, very carefully, kid gloves, very, very slowly. And also, not just that, I was very nervous. I never once doubted my original feelings. I'd dated other girls, I'd lived with another girl before, but these feelings I was having for Stephanie were completely different. So I equated that to love. I think my friends, they, they joked. They, you know, they, they thought I was crazy, but I didn't. I might have been crazy, but I knew I was right. John's gentle wooing of the mysterious Stephanie was indeed rather slow. After more than two years of meeting at the telex machine, Stephanie finally agreed to go out with him. Their first proper date was at a cafe next to Golders Green tube station. When she finally agreed to uh, have a date, she, she said this place, and I said, yep, yeah, fine. She says, well, I live nearby. So I said, great. Got there at the right appointed time, only about 15 minutes early, you know, just to make sure I was on time. And there was I twiddling my thumbs. The apprehension, the nervousness, there was a mixture of all those feelings inside me. And I waited there a number of hours, and she never turned up. Gutted. I couldn't believe it. She was something that was taking up a lot of my mind, a lot of my heart, you know, that's what I could think of. Why couldn't she get a message to me? Why couldn't she just come down? Why could she even say she'd bother to meet me when she didn't want to? But I couldn't ring her and find out. I had to wait till I had the next opportunity to meet her, which was hopefully at work on Monday, but I didn't know whether I'd see her. being David's wife. We were both in our 50s, and it's not that easy, you think, you know, on the shelf, who am I going to meet? It was a lovely, lovely day. And I had my little granddaughter there, and we had my son and his wife. When I actually walked up and saw David, he was so nervous. It was lovely. I was quite pleased he was so nervous. Because <laughs> I think it really meant something then, you know. It wasn't tall blasé or anything, you know. I mean, don't forget, we'd both been married twice before. Um, and when you're taking that step for the third time, you really, really do think about it. It was a really, really lovely wedding. And I'd, I've got absolutely no regrets about being married whatsoever. It's the best thing that happened to me, best thing in my life. Yeah, it was wonderful. So I was surprised that you could feel quite so passionately about somebody at my age. It felt like being a teenager in love all over again. It's a wonderful feeling. Was it passionate? Very passionate, very passionate. Yes, it was good. I never lacked in anything. After their wedding, David and Wendy returned home. Wendy to run her pub, David to his job in the docks. I've been loved before, but never loved and looked after and cared for and made to laugh the way David made me. My son actually said, if you can make my mother laugh like that, then you're all right by me. We've been married one and a half years and they were absolutely brilliant years, really good. We were very happy, David got promotion, he was earning good money and everything seemed to be going right for us. It was great. The pub was picking up. We were looking forward to a future together. I got a phone call from my eldest son saying that he wanted to see me. So I went round there. And when I got into my son's house, they, they were both stood there and you, you know when something's wrong. And I thought he was going to tell me that he wanted to stay here or something but he told me that 
my husband had been trying to kill me. And I, I can remember I just laughed. I did, I really did. I just I said, told, told him not to be so stupid. And he said, no, he said, we've got proof. And I said, what proof? He said, there's a tape. When I got into my son's house, um, they were both standing there and they said, sit down. I said, no, I don't want to sit down. What's the matter? I thought somebody died or something. And he said, no, listen to the tape, Mum, please. Listen to the tape. I said, OK, I'll listen to the tape. I'll listen to the tape. And it was awful. You ain't fucking me about, Dave. No. I mean, you definitely want me to top her. Yeah, I don't mind, mate. Because I ain't fucking... I'm easy, mate. I can soon find another wife. And I sat on the floor listening to it, and um, and I knew that it was David on the tape. There was no two ways about it. She's worth doing, mate. I'd just have to... I'd have to go into everything and what she fucking got. Mm. Insurances and everything. I need a photograph of the bird bush, because I ain't going to come into your pub or anything like that. No. I want a photograph of her. You can't miss her. She's a fucking great thing. Well, fat. Big. I couldn't understand why he was saying these things. None of it made any sense to me. Make sure she's fucking dead. I don't want to end up looking after a fucking vegetable. You know she will, because I shall fucking... That motor of mine just fucking plow straight into her and knock her down, something like that. Are you serious? Serious. She's nothing to me. I said, none of this makes sense. I don't have any money. We're very happy. Why would he want me dead? You know, um, and... At the same time as thinking that, I knew it was him. But your boys believed the tape? Of course they did. They did believe it, because they were frightened for me. They were very worried for me. They said to me when I'd heard the tape, you've got two choices, Mother. And the first one was for them to go around to sort David out, which is not what I wanted got two very big, strong boys. I mean, Dave's a big fella, but they would have killed him. They were so wound up. I didn't want to see my husband beaten up, and I didn't want to see my two sons being held on a murder charge. Um, so I phoned the police. On Sunday, February the 27th, the police went to the Beresford pub and arrested David Gibson on suspicion of conspiring or soliciting to have his wife, Wendy, murdered. Well, it was all very romantic, like it is in the beginning. Two little lovebirds was really good. He was allowed to phone any time of day or night. It didn't matter because he was working on shifts through the police station. And then he came down about three weeks later to come and see me. I introduced him to everybody I knew because he was just so wonderful. You know, this is the guy you want to show everybody to, you know, even the neighbours. You know, I was just so proud to walk next to him and to be with him, and it was just wonderful. I even took him to my workplace because everybody was so excited for me and really happy, and they just thought he was absolutely fantastic. And they were very impressed by him, you know? Whilst I was in Poole, he said that he missed me so much and that he wanted to do something very, very special for me. And when I asked him what, he said very romantically that he was going to set off at four in the morning and drive to the Lake District. This was going to be our dream place to live. And he was going to climb the highest mountain and he was going to get me a rock from the top. And he did. He phoned me at four in the morning before he was leaving. And I think he phoned me at 10 in the morning at my mum's pub to say that I've got it. I've got your rock. And I just thought, you know, what kind of guy does that? It's got to be wonderful. I must be the luckiest woman in the world. So lucky did Joanne feel that six months after meeting Martin, she handed in her notice and left her job in Poole, where she'd recently been promoted.
When John did meet Stephanie again, all she could say was that there had been problems about getting out of the house to see him. I sort of accepted it, and we arranged then maybe to make another meeting. So, OK, I said, yeah, OK. But, you know, I said, but please be there and all this. Now, why don't I come and pick you up from your door? No, no, I can't do that. Second time, we were successful. And we were able to meet in this little cafe down in uh, Golders Green. We just carried on the sort of conversations we'd had from work over a cup of coffee. I tried to sort of touch hands and all those sort of things and try to start to sort of break some barriers. And he said, right, got to go. And I said, do you have to go? You know, as one does, he says, yes, I've got to go back. I can't be out for long. All right, OK. Can I, can I take you home, make you cook? No. Nope. It's OK, she had to dash off. For about two years, I suppose, Stephanie and I were having these little clandestines meetings. And as much as in the background, I may have thought they were a little bit strange, the way they were sort of panning out sometimes. I knew deep down I loved her, and I accepted it. We were getting closer. It all mounted up into meaningful relationship, in my opinion. All I did start to understand a lot more was the fact that her uncle was very strict with her which was the reason, obviously, for all these clandestine types of meetings, the only really times when he was away. But I didn't understand anything else to her background. She used to just call it the problems at home. Uh, OK, it was never sort of explained what these problems were or why she couldn't, but I thought, well, this seems a bit strange. You ain't fucking me about, Dave. No. I mean, you definitely want me to top her. With her husband remanded in custody, Wendy was not allowed to talk to David to find out why he'd said he wanted her murdered. That motor of mine just fucking ploughed straight into her, knock her down, something like that. Did you for one minute think that he would have done you harm? Oh, God, no. No, that was never a problem to me. I knew that he would never, ever harm me. When Wendy went to the police to say that she wanted to retract her statement, she was advised to go away and think things over. Exactly a week after David was arrested, Wendy went on a cruise to the Caribbean with a friend, a holiday she and David had booked as their second honeymoon. I went over the tape time and time again, and every time things were coming back into my mind, that thinking, no, this doesn't make any more sense than it did the first time I heard it. There was no reason why he should want me dead. I mean, if, he'd, if he wasn't happy in the marriage, he could have gone, because he, he knew I didn't have any money. But it wasn't like that. We were both soulmates. I came back. My son met me from the airport. And my son had said to me, if you make the decision the wrong way, that'll be it. I don't want anything to do with you. And I said, well, with all the respect and love in the world, I've got to make the decision for myself, you know. <laughs> and I said, I have made a decision. The following morning, Wendy made a second statement. She still had not seen David. I said I really didn't think that my husband was guilty of anything. I didn't want to prosecute my husband. I thought all I had to do was say, this is a load of nonsense. Um, we can stop it now. That afternoon, Wendy saw and spoke to David for the very first time. We did fall into each other's arms, and I just said, why, what on earth were you doing? And he was sad and sorry, and, you know, when I said to him, but David, all right, it, it's stupid what you've done, but why say those awful things? And he just said, look, I'm, I just got carried away. What David told Wendy that afternoon and what he'd also told the police when he was arrested was that he knew he was being tape recorded. He'd gone along with it because he thought the other man would use the tape to blackmail him for more work in the docks. David said if he was blackmailed, he intended using the tape to get the other man sacked. I had the most wonderful relationship with my husband and there was absolutely no reason in this world why he would want to harm me. I didn't think we realised the real seriousness of the case. 
we thought that it, it was just so stupid that it would all get thrown out. I always felt that feeling deep inside of what I felt for her, how much I liked her, how much I wanted to be with her. And obviously, I think how much I loved her, because I had that feeling right from the very, very early beginnings. So, as much as there may have been times of frustration, exasperation, or, well, why can't we just go out? Why can't we just do that? It'd be so easy to get to know each other. And that wasn't possible. But I think that's what made it special, uh, in some ways. It was a very old-fashioned courtship. Um, we would talk a lot, um, we would laugh a lot, and we do a lot of touching, holding hands, um, just, you know, stroking, but no kissing. We were getting closer. There was affection between us, although it wasn't this slobbering, kissing, groping, or that. I, I was also exceedingly hard for me to kiss Stephanie. Not that I'm not used to kissing women at that stage. It was obvious, you can't kiss me yet. I knew he loved me, and he would do anything for me, and that was nice. I'd say it took two, two and a half years before I felt that our relationship had gone to the point where I could say, will you marry me? Now, I think the only way to do it is to do it properly. So I had to get an engagement ring. I had to find a nice place to propose to her. And she's bound to say yes. I say, right, Steph, get a snip out. We can go down this uh, little pub in the Bleeding Heart Yard. Wonderful name. And a nice little restaurant called the Bleeding Heart. Lovely little place. And uh, we're having our little chit chats. And uh, I knew Stephanie couldn't be there for long. She had to get back soon. What he said was that, uh, you know, I'd like, um, how do you feel about marriage? And um, how do you feel about children? And would you be able to, you know, um, consider settling down? Um, and I was listening and I said, yes, I would at some point in my life. And then he talked more and then I knew it was a proposal. And he said, you know, would you consider ever putting up with me? I showed her the ring and I said, will you marry me? Um, and she said, no. By June, I decided that was it. We were going to be together. And Martin drove all the way down and collected me. And on the way, I was thinking, well, you know, this is closing one door, and I had my whole life to look forward to now, and this was the start. As we were driving through it, I mean, I could see the sea view, and I thought, oh, how pretty. So I was really quite excited and looking forward to it. The vision I had in my mind was obviously somewhere quite nice, upper class maybe, um, clean and tidy. You know, I thought, well, he's a policeman, he's got to have a good house and good prospects. As we drove through, it just sort of declined. We sort of passed the nice houses and we went into a less nice area. I was shocked, very shocked, because where we were was almost like a council estate. And I found this quite confusing. And I even remember saying to him, is this your house? And he said, oh, yeah. And I said, oh. I'd left a good area, good job, and I thought, what have I walked into? The first thing I noticed is there wasn't a lot of furniture. There was no oven, there was no microwave, there was no washing machine, no fridge. There was a bed, and that was it. He explained to me that because he was an undercover policeman and he works in the drug raids, that it was important for him to work among people that take drugs. And it's better to work in the midst of it. And obviously nobody knows he's an undercover policeman. And so he keeps an eye on all the neighbours. And I thought, well, oh, wow, this guy has the guts 
to really live in it. I just thought it was very brave. It's not forever. You're talking about six months. We're going to be in the Lake District then. We're going to start our life and our family together. So just make things work. By the time Joanne moved in with Martin, he told her he was no longer working full time as an undercover policeman because of his back injury. Obviously with the accident, he had been taken off the beat. So we would maybe go to the police station, you know, once a week. He would go in, drop some paperwork off, I'd stay outside and he'd come back and we would sort of drive off and he's done his little thing. You can imagine how hard it is for somebody working as a policeman and then suddenly just it all stop. My mom and dad were so supportive that obviously with Martin's job coming to an end that they decided to give us both a little job at the pub. I would help out and Martin would work there. So he would still have an active role in as sort of looking out for the pub, looking out for people there, you know, who was drinking or driving. I suppose you just can't stop being a policeman, can you, overnight? So I could understand that. By October, Joanne had been with Martin for 10 months. Then one morning, she got a telephone call at the Seagull pub. It was from my friend Alison. Now, she had been at the pub the night before and she had driven home and she'd been stopped by the police and had been done for drinking and driving. She was adamant with the policeman that it was Martin Baxter that had called in and got her stopped. She told me that the policeman had said at the station that they had never heard of Martin Baxter. I didn't believe her. Jonathan didn't know anything at all about my lifestyle. He knew my uncle was wealthy. He knew he was very strict. Very little was said about Stephanie's background. So she kept that part all very quiet. Certainly her uncle was a very powerful person. He, I found out he has dealings with the Pope's financing. I had a friend of mine at work who knew a little bit about Stephanie and was dropping a few hints. I, because it got to be known that we were sort of an item. And he said, oh, do you know she's a princess? I remember one of the uh, little chats that Steph and I used to say, come on, Steph, sit down. Let's hear a bit more about you, you know. Someone's been saying you're a princess, and you know, and all this. She was very coy. What Stephanie had not told John was that she came from one of the wealthiest families in Ghana. Her mother was a queen, Nana Bohima II, and Stephanie herself was destined to be Nana Bohima the Third. The reason why I didn't talk to John too much about um, how wealthy we were or, or my background or the fact that I was destined to be a queen was because I knew the kind of person that I was supposed to be marrying. It had to be somebody rich, somebody of a high standing in the community, and somebody who's accepting of what I was supposed to be, which was a queen. The Stephanie, who I knew, was actually a princess destined to be queen, who was with me all this time, sitting across from me in our little cafe, and I hadn't the faintest idea about it. I thought, that's intriguing. <laughs> I wanted to be totally sure that I felt as strongly about him as I knew he felt about me, because for me, I needed to go through that time to make completely sure that I was going to give up everything that I was brought up to be um, for Jonathan. Around November, November the 17th, I invited her again, straight off to work, only for a short period of time, so I proposed to marry her. And she said yes this time. And I was elated. You know, I was completely elated. I just took the ring and he said, I, I said I had to go. And he, um, again, I was expecting him to say, we just got engaged, you know. But no, he said, OK. And then I went. I went home. I had to go home, because my uncle was coming home. And I just thought, ah, oh, this is going to be great. You know, it's going to be fun. But I didn't realise there'd be a few more hurdles that we'd have to go through. I refused to believe her. I thought she was trying to wind me up. And I thought to myself, I'm going to go and find out by myself. 
So I asked my brother to come with me and we drove to the police station and I went in there and I said, have you, uh, do you have a policeman Martin Baxter working here? They said no. And I tried to think, well, he's undercover. So perhaps they're not allowed to tell me or they've got their wires crossed. I thought the only way I'm going to get the truth is by going to his grandmother's house. My brother drove me down. When we got there, I said, I've just got a few questions to ask you. And what I asked first, I said, is Martin a policeman? And I remember his grandmother sort of chuckling and saying, no, Martin's not a policeman. He's on income support. I said, are you sure? She said, Martin is not a policeman. And I said, well, has he been to Northern Ireland? You know, where his front friend got shot? And she sort of laughed again and she said, no, Martin was only in training for six months. He's never been in the army. I then went back to the police station and I said, I need you to give me assistance to the house and get all my stuff out there. I could not bear to walk in that house by myself and do it. Because the first thing that came in my mind, oh my God, who have I been living with? And we walked in the house and Martin was sitting on the chair, very still, with his head down. And the policeman said to him, do you understand that it is a criminal offence to impersonate a policeman? There was no reply. And he asked him again, and he nodded. And I was just shocked. I then went upstairs, grabbed everything I could, and just had to get out of there, because I didn't, I didn't know where I was. And the policeman said, do you realise you've now lost all your privileges to Neighbourhood Watch? Because that's all he was. And I walked out. Um, after John asked me to marry him, I started to worry, obviously, because um, I told my mother and I told my auntie, who were the two most important people in my life, and the third most important person in my life was the hardest person to tell. That was my uncle. <sighs> Actually, what I said was, um, I was a chicken. I said, uh, um, I met this young man that I wanted to go out with, and um, he, he just looked at me. And when he said, um, who is he, told him. Um, and then I think as soon as I said he was English, he hit the roof. That wasn't um, what he wanted to hear. And I stood there and he said, has it gone further? I said, yes, uncle. And I just took out the ring and, and showed him. He looked at the ring and again he flew off the handle. I listened and very quietly and he asked me to go to Ghana. I was on a plane two days later and my uncle had a party at his house. It was very strange because everybody was paying a lot of attention to me and I couldn't figure out why. I began to think it was because I was getting engaged to John, you know, so they all understood and they were all happy. And uh, it all hit home when I got up to dance with this young man and everybody started clapping and I was wondering why they were clapping. My uncle was just basically hoping that I would just notice what I was giving up, all these wonderful young men, very wealthy and of the same um, um, standing as we were, and, and then just not want to go back. And I was distraught, and just the feeling of not seeing John again was enough for me, and somehow I knew if I didn't leave, I'd probably be made to stay there. I think I maybe had one phone call from her, first of all, that she'd got there safely and everything. And then the next phone call I had from her was after some party, she said, that went very wrong, that the uncle had arranged for her to meet all the eligible men around, and she wanted to come home straight away and to meet me at the airport. 
was it nice when she came off the plane? Oh, definitely. You know, see, I mean, it's always nice seeing anybody walking off a plane and seeing her walking off a plane back to me. It was absolutely wonderful. It was the beginning of our life, really, because at that point, everything changed. I went and visited him every single day. He was on remand. And that's quite hard to do when you've got a business to run. But every day I was up there. And uh, I don't know, I don't think we'd have both got through it if, if we hadn't seen each other every day. Did you still love him just as much? Yeah. At David Gibson's plea trial in April, he pleaded not guilty and was released on bail on condition he lived in the matrimonial home with Wendy, the wife he was accused of soliciting to murder. Because of this bail condition, Wendy and David believed the case would not go to court. But they were wrong. It wasn't an easy time going to the court because we were still obviously together and, and um, we'd get up in the morning and walk the dogs and then we'd have to go off to court together. And every day that week it was all in the headlines of the paper, which was awful. Foreman offers 20,000 to work colleague to kill his wife. They weren't sure at first whether they were going to be allowed to play the tape, but then they, 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 they did, and obviously everybody was shocked. I mean, you definitely want me to top her. Yeah, I don't mind, mate, because I'm fucking... I'm easy, mate, I can soon find another wife. From the witness box, David denied soliciting to murder Wendy and said he still loved his wife. He claimed the other man was nicknamed EMI, because he was rumoured to have tape recorded a number of people. David told the court he did not like the other man and reiterated his claim that he thought he was going to be blackmailed. I mean, if you want somebody killed, you're not going to go to your arch enemy and say to them, you kill my wife. It wouldn't happen that way. Wendy believed David, but would the jury? Friday, October the 20th, was the final day of the trial. And it was just a summing up. And I thought the judge was quite favourable for David. But they asked, before that, they asked to listen to the tape again before the jury went out. Make sure she's fucking dead. I don't want to end up looking after a fucking vegetable. And then that's when they said they couldn't reach a decision. Oh, God. So we had to go out again. Oh, and Dave and I, we just sort of just sort of looked at each other, you know. And we said, we, we, we said to, we were hugging each other and, I, and we both said, whatever happens, we've got to be strong for each other. And I promised him I would be. When the jury came back in for the second time, um, they didn't take very long. They took about 20 minutes, and we, we were quite, we thought, oh, good, you know, maybe good. Then they said that it was guilty. I just died, part of me died. I thought, how can you find him guilty? And um, then the judge, I, I, I vaguely recollect the judge sort of saying some things. And then he said, I sentence you to eight years. And I just, in total disbelief. My life's changed because of what's happened. I'm extremely lonely. You cannot imagine the type of loneliness that I feel. I haven't given up on my family, they've given up on me. I unfortunately don't see my eldest son. And I'm very sad that I've lost my grandchildren. Hopefully when my grandsons are a bit older, I'll be able to speak to them, but it does hurt. Love is blind. I saw what I chose to see. I wanted to see the house in the main district. I saw the white wedding dress. I saw the little two kids in the garden. That's what I saw. Me and him, blissfully happy.
Several weeks after Joanne moved her things out of the house, she went round to see Martin again. I wanted him to be truthful and honest with me and tell me that he had formulated this big story to impress me. He loved me so much that he felt somebody on income support I wouldn't accept. When I arrived, he said, I know you find all this very difficult to understand, but I've got my policeman friend here to confirm that I was really in Northern Ireland, my best friend did get shot and killed, and that I am really an undercover policeman. And the reason they can't reveal such information is that they would blow my cover. And I think it was in that moment I thought, nah, you're still lying. Did you realize that it was over? I realized at that moment it was over. If Martin had told me the truth and said, I've made this all up, let's start again, I would have married him and been happy to, because I loved him. I've never been able to trust anybody again. It doesn't matter what they say, it's almost like I've got to double check everything. I quiz them, I try to remember exactly what they're saying, and in case they change the story later on. He took everything. He took the one main thing that you need in a relationship, and that is trust. Once we had broken up, I went on the rebound. The first guy that would listen to me, I got involved with. I became pregnant and had twins. But I also realized that I got myself into a very, very bad relationship. <laughs> Come on, little man. Joanne is living once again in Dorset, bringing up her twins, Shannon and Jordan, on her own. I believe that my two children have kept me together as a person. They've given me something to look forward to. And things are looking really, really up. And in the last eight months, things are starting to come together. I'm trying to rebuild my life. And I hope maybe one day I will perhaps meet somebody and get married. Steph and I now have been married for 12 years. It was our 12th anniversary this year. So I'd known her four years before that, so 16 years, but she had 12 years married. All from that look I got from across the room in a restaurant from Jonathan, that changed my whole life. This is what I was meant to be. I believe that strongly. Do you think there's a sense of some sort of destiny about you two being together? Of course. Of course, I, I remember when I was um, about nine, ten years old, um, I think it was one of our servants or uh, one of my aunts that um, she felt that I'd be, <laughs> I'd be married an Englishman because <laughs> no Ghanaian man would put up with me. <laughs> when Stefan and I started to uh, get together, we sort of found out we make babies quite easily. And not long, one popped along, Alexandra, who's now 12. And not long after that, we had another little bundle of joy, Natalia, who's now 11, just turned. No, 10. Sorry, she's got it wrong. I have, haven't I? 10. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> and not long after that, we had another one, Jonathan. That's eight, coming up to nine. And not long after that, Dominique, little bundle of joy, who's now three. And quite recently, yet another addition, 18 months ago, Cameron. Did you intend to have as many as five? Steph used to joke about six. Sometimes she used to joke about 12. I used to cry. <laughs> we love having a big family. It always made me laugh. So yeah, it's wonderful. I wouldn't have it any other way. And I'm very, very proud going out with them. They're always happy as well. My children are always, always happy. If it wasn't for my stretch marks, I'd have more. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, but we always make sure we have time for each other. We always end up cuddling in the evening, mm. sitting down under a nice fur blanket. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no more baby stuff. <laughs> We'd made a pact to love each other and make it work. It wasn't easy, especially when I'd go and overspend and, and he will get the credit card bills. He's still trying to teach me about the money. Still trying after 12 years. I learned a lot about housekeeping and cleaning. I'm a better mother than I am a cleaner. No, the cleaning, I don't like that part, no. It's boring bit, isn't it? No, it's boring bit. But you haven't got all the servants to do it for you now. I know, that's the, the, the difference is that, yes, I haven't got any servants to do it for me. You know, when I compare that lifestyle, it's very, very different. And as much as I had a lot to give up, I would never swap the love I have in my family for anything else. If you see something and you want it, you've got to follow it. Mm. If you give up, you've only got yourself to blame. Yes. If you don't do what makes you happy, you'd be miserable for the rest of your life wondering. It's not worth it. As I say, it's, a, it's not a dress rehearsal. I've mm -hmm. only got one life. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So I've made all the right decisions. We could do with the servants, though. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that'd just be icing on the cake, wouldn't it? <laughs> I think, like a lot of people, when they hear the story, they just think, I'm some silly woman that's madly and blindly in love. I am madly in love, but not blindly. I'm not a stupid teenager in love. I'm frightened that I won't find anybody else. I know what Dave and I've got is something very, very special. He knows he was stupid. But eight years is a long time for being stupid, isn't it? I go to see David every every Thursday, but the night before is, is always the same. You think I'd be used to it now, but I still get so excited I can't sleep. I just live for those days. Nothing will ever part us again. We'll be together forever. And it's what we both want. I love him, but I know that he loves me just as much, and he's told me that he's never loved anybody the same way he loves me. And he knows that we're right for each other. We've always known that. Fantastic. Yeah, we always have a really good visit. Yeah, it's really, really nice. Did lots of laughing, lots of talking, lots of holding hands. Really, really nice. Looking forward to the next one now. <laughs> good girl. Good girl. It is a love story. You can't have find anybody that's more in love with their husband than I am. I'm just a very, very lucky woman to have found somebody that I love as much as I do and it's reciprocated. I think that's lucky. We're going through a bad spot at the moment, but it won't be forever. And then everyone's going to be really jealous of me because I'm going to be the happiest person in the world. They ask me how I knew My true love was true Something here inside cannot be denied.